He 
desires to be there for every single little tiny thing in your life. You may not know really how to call on him today, but whatever the need is in your life, you can call on him for that. You can say, Lord, you are my provider. And to him you can say, say, Lord, you're my salvation. Whatever it is you need, Lord, you are the Father that I never had. Lord, you're everything I need today. Lord, when I'm lonely, Lord, you're my friend that sticks closer than a brother. Yes, you are. favorite hymns, listening how great thou art, because I feel like this goes so perfectly with this song, because this is the hymn that sings to God, how great you are, how great thou art. Let's lift our voices and sing. Then sings my song, my song. Sings my 
chapter 141 verse 2 he says let my prayers arise like incense to you and so when we sing we're reminded that our words don't just stop at the ceiling no matter what it sounds like in your ears it's a beautiful sweet aroma to God and so when we sing today we don't just have some kind of concert we're not trying to uh, to sing something that makes us feel good. No, our praise is directed to him. And the scripture tells us that he is worthy of it all. Do you believe that today? Would you just lift your hands to him right now and would you go ahead and give him all of your praise? Would you go ahead and just give it all to him right now? Don't reserve anything back. Father, we're here this morning because you're worth more praise than we can give. God, you're here. we're here this morning because you allowed us to be here. You allowed us to come together as your people and sing praises to you today. Lord, let our songs, let our worship be a sweet aroma to you this morning. God, we stand in your house and we lift our hands to you, not just out of, out of, out of obligation, but God, from a heart that's filled with praise today. Lord, we recognize that you've been so good to us, that you've cared for us, God, that you've that you've provided for us. God, we thank you today for your saving work that you've done in our hearts and lives. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that is alive and at work on the inside of us. And Lord, we pray today that you would receive our worship. Lord, let it be a sweet aroma to you. Lord, let our prayers rise to you as incense. And Lord, today we pray that, that your word and your spirit would do a work in our hearts. Lord, that you would change the parts of us that need to be changed. God, that you would encourage those who are discouraged. God, that you would speak hope and healing and restoration. In Jesus' name we pray and the whole church says. One more time, let's give the Lord praise together for all he's doing. Amen. Amen. Why don't you smile at somebody on the way down? Give them, a, give them a smile and a wave. And if you're brave, give them a high five or something. A couple of brave people right there. This has been a roller coaster of a week. I, I, I can't speak for you, but you can speak for you. I can speak for me. This has been one of these weeks. Has anybody had one of these weeks before? You know, if we could rewind and go back to last Sunday, 
and I could talk to myself for just five minutes, I think I would just say, hey, put a seatbelt on because it's going to get like this. There's been times this week that I've seen the undeniable hand of God at work in people's lives. You know what I mean? Like there, there's times that people have contacted me this week and said, God is doing something amazing. And, and as they lay out the situation and they tell me the whole story, I, I step back and I say, there is no question that God is at work in your life. And then there's been other times this week that I've stepped back and said, what in the world is going on? Like, God, I, I, I don't get it. I don't understand it. Literally this week, I've seen God show up in amazing, undeniable ways. And then other times I've been like, I just don't understand. Does anybody feel like that? Would you just raise your hand? If you're not comfortable saying amen in church, that's okay. In fact, we could practice it. Why don't you say amen? amen. See how easy it is? It's not that bad. I look at what God is doing in the world and, and, and I recognize that many of you feel the exact same way that I do. You know, there's times where you are on the mountaintop, there's times where things are happening, it's unbelievable. And then there's other times where you just go, okay, God, where are you? Hey God, if I could do that water into wine thing, I sure would have done something similar right here. I wanna to talk to you this morning out of my heart. I, I've been preparing a, a series out of the book of 1 Corinthians, and I believe that God's going to take us there. But God rerouted some of my plans on Thursday. And, and I believe that I have a very specific message for you. But before we get into it, I, I need to make sure that we're on the same playing field. I'm not here today to explain God to you. God doesn't answer to us. I don't know where we got that kind of mentality that God owes us an explanation or that God should, should work in a way that, 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 that goes along with what we think should happen. Isaiah 55 is very clear. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. I can't explain God to you. I can't explain God to you because I don't understand him fully. I, I feel like I barely scratched the surface in my relationship with God. There's so much more that he wants to do in my life and in your life that if I were to stand up and say, okay, when we walk out of here at 11 whatever, at 12 whatever, at 1 whatever, I'm just kidding. When we walk out of here... You're going to know so much more and understand God completely. If you came in here with that hope of walking in here and saying, well, God, I'm, i got to go to church today because i got to figure you out. You're in the wrong place. But if you come in here burdened, maybe even a little bit confused, maybe you walk in here and you're carrying a situation that you've been carrying for a while now, maybe you come in here and you're a little bit discouraged, then you're in the right place. There's a popular phrase in Christianity today, and many of you are aware of it, and it's almost a buzzword. I believe in this. I'm not knocking it at all, but there are some divine appointments that take place. Has anybody ever had a divine appointment in their life? Now, if you're not familiar with this terminology, it's okay. Well, what Christians usually mean when they say divine appointment, they usually mean something took place in their life. Something happened that they thought was going to be an ordinary, regular, mundane appointment, but then out of nowhere, God shows up and does something powerful. Maybe you thought it was just a regular Tuesday, and you went into work, and before you knew it, God had done so many different things in your life. Maybe you thought it was just a regular cup of coffee that you were going to have a conversation with a friend, and the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and brings encouragement and wisdom. Maybe you thought it was just a regular Sunday and you are going to go to a life group, but then God speaks to you in a powerful way and it becomes a divine appointment. Has anybody seen that happen in their life? I don't question that one bit. I believe that there are times in our lives where when we're walking according to God's plan, when we're, we're doing what God wants us to do, that out of nowhere, 
heaven invades earth. And everything in your heart and everything in your mind just gets turned immediately. And you step back from the situation. You get in your car or you go to your house or whatever it looks like and you go, wow, God really showed up in an amazingly powerful way. But just as much as I recognize that truth at work in my life and in yours, if I'm being completely transparent with you, not only are there divine appointments in my life, sometimes there are divine disappointments. Things that that happen in my life that I go, wow, I, I, I didn't see it taking place like that. Things that take place, situations that don't get resolved, prayers that don't get answered, or maybe even God says no, or maybe even God says not yet, or maybe even God doesn't say anything at all. Some of you have experienced that. You've prayed, and your prayers moved from the hospital to the funeral home. Some of you have prayed, and the prayers moved from your bedroom to the jail room. Some of you have prayed, and you believed, and you had faith that could move mountains, and you just knew that something was going to take place, and it was all going to work out exactly like you wanted it to until it didn't. And you find yourself saying, God, I've got faith and I know that you can move mountains and I know that you can raise the dead and I know that you can heal the sick. But if I'm being totally transparent, I'm pretty disappointed in this situation because I really wanted it to go another way. Nobody walks down the aisle and says, I do, and plans on their marriage ending in divorce. Nobody walks out of the hospital room carrying the bundle of joy with the anticipation that this is gonna be someone that breaks your heart. And so if you're here this morning, I I, I just wanna, I wanna take a minute and I I wanna peel back the layers and I want us to let the Holy Spirit just look inside our heart and, and, and just cut through all the clutter and get through all the noise and just say, okay, God, if I'm being totally transparent, if I'm honest before you, if I'm just laying my soul bare before you today, I've got a little bit of disappointment in my life. I wish that things would have worked out another way. I want to talk to you about that today, but before we dive into the scripture, before we get into the message, before we talk about divine disappointments, are you open to that? Like, are you open to the idea that God wants to speak to your heart in such a powerful way that it might even be uncomfortable for you? You you might even find yourself confronted with some things in your life that God says, okay, I'm doing a work. Are you open to the idea that God would take you into a territory that would bring you into a place that you're just not familiar with, but you're going to have to trust him? Are you open to that? If so, let's pray. Father, we come to you today with open hearts. and God, we we wanna be honest and vulnerable today. God, we, we recognize that you're a great God. But Lord, we also recognize there are times in our lives where things just don't make sense. And so many of us are just grasping for some sort of confirmation in our life, for some sort of uh, resolution in our life. God, we're just looking for something to work out. God, I I just pray that we would, through your Holy Spirit, open our hearts in a powerful way. God, for those that are discouraged, for those that are disappointed, Lord, for maybe even those that are disappointed in you because you didn't do what they wanted you to do. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through your word, that you would help us to be transparent with you and that you would write on our hearts your word and your will, that you would bring comfort and strength today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today, we're going to look at three places in the scripture of people who were at the very least disappointed in what was happening in their lives. 
people who had faith, people who in some cases knew God, people in, who in some cases were doing the right things, people who in some cases were very close to Jesus, but situations just didn't work out exactly like they wanted them to. And if you're here today and you say, well, you know, I, I've got a little bit of disappointment in my life. You're not alone. You're not alone in, in the scripture. You're not alone in, in Christian history. You're not alone in this room. The first person we look at is a familiar character in the book of Genesis, chapter 40. Turn with me. You can flip in your Bibles or on your screen. If you didn't bring a Bible today, that's okay. We'll have the scriptures for you on the screen. In this Genesis, chapter 40 account, there's a famous character, a guy named Joseph. And if anybody had a roller coaster life, it was this guy, Joseph. In chapter 40, beginning in verse 1, we'll read a few verses. You can read along with me. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master. The king of Egypt, Pharaoh, was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph and he attended them. Now stop there for just a moment. Joseph is one of these guys that's been on the roller coaster of life. Just a few chapters earlier, God gave Joseph a dream. And in this dream, he said, you're going to rule over everybody. And Joseph went and told those who are closest to him, his family. And as he went and told them, they didn't quite have the response that he was hoping for. They got angry, they got jealous, they stripped him of his beautiful gifted robe from his dad and they threw him in a pit and they sold him into slavery. There in slavery, he started to build a name for himself and he started to do well and God's hand was on him and God was with him and he worked his way up and was doing well only to have his boss's wife tell lies and falsely accuse him. And so here he is in prison again. And at this point, Joseph was somewhere around 11 or 12 years in prison in Egypt, in a foreign land, away from his family. This is a guy that had a dream from God. This is a guy who he just knew that God was gonna do something powerful. And so in this prison, in this time of things aren't working out like I want them to, Two other guys get thrown into the prison, the cupbearer and the baker. And after they had been in custody for some time, the scripture says this, verse 5, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night. And each dream had a meaning of its own. And when Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there's no one to interpret them. Now stop right there for another moment. Joseph, he he comes to these guys and they're looking really sad. And he says, why are you sad? And they said, well, we had some dreams, but we don't understand what they mean. There's no one to interpret them. And this is an important part in the story of, of Joseph's life and in your life. You see, Joseph did something that was powerful, but, but before we look at that, we have to recognize what Joseph didn't do. See, Joseph had experience with dreams. In fact, this is what got Joseph in the mess that he's in now, interpreting dreams. Joseph, he, he went to his brothers and he said, I'm going to rule over the land. And his brothers sold him into slavery and his life started doing this. And he just, it, it got on the wrong trajectory. And now he finds himself in prison. And these two guys come to him and they say, hey, we've got some dreams too. You know, if I were Joseph, it would be really easy for me to go completely silent. You know, the last time I started interpreting dreams, look what happened. I think I'm going to stay out of this one. And I bring that to you because that's where some of you are. You saw God bring something into your life in a powerful way, but it hasn't really worked out like you pictured it was going to work out. And so when somebody else starts to rejoice, whenever somebody else starts to go through something, whenever somebody else is struggling with something, instead of engaging, you go silent. 
And you say, well, you know, I, I'm not somebody that can really talk about that because I, I reached out one time. I stepped out in faith one time. I, I did something one time and look where it got me. Now I, I'm in a place where my life just doesn't make sense. It'd been easy for Joseph to be silent. It would have been easy for Joseph to be cynical. Joseph could have looked at those guys and said, hey guys, listen, let me tell you from a guy with some experience, stay away from the dreams. Joseph could have looked at them and said, listen, interpreting dreams is not a good plan for anybody. If I were you, I'd just chalk it up to bad pizza and go to sleep tonight and hope you don't get anything else. And some of you get cynical like that. Some of you, because of your situation and where you are and because it's not lined up exactly like you thought it should be, you become cynical, you withdraw, or, or you say, I, I don't want to be involved in this. But see, Joseph, he, he's not silent and he's not cynical. Joseph does something that's so powerful for us to learn. And if we can get a hold of this, this will be part of changing your life. It may not explain everything that you're going through, but at least this will be something that'll, that'll put you on the trajectory of your faith to where you can start to say, okay, God, I'm moving forward. L look what Joseph says in the second part of verse eight. He says, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. And Joseph in his disappointment, Joseph in, in his prison, Joseph in his place where things are not working out, Joseph teaches us this, keep the focus on God. He, he didn't say, well, you know what? I'm really good at dreams. I can handle this. I can interpret him. No, he says, dreams belong to God. If things aren't working out the way you think they should, don't go silent and don't go cynical. Keep trusting God because it all belongs to him. You see, so often God puts something in our lives. So often God gives us something and then we take it and we want to make it work. Do you know why God doesn't reveal more of his plan to us, self-included? Because I'd, I'd try so hard to make it happen before the time. I'd do everything I could to make it work. And I'd do everything I could to take ownership of it. Can I remind you that when you came to Christ, you submitted to his lordship. No longer do you own everything. It all belongs to him now. Even the dreams and the hopes and the plans that you have. And so Joseph teaches us to keep the focus on God. Don't, don't put your trust in an outcome. Don't put your trust in an idea or a picture that you think it's gonna happen. Put your trust in a faithful God who never fails. And that's what Joseph is teaching us. And so they tell him the dreams and you know the rest of the story, everything that happens. Joseph is teaching us here, keep the focus on God. And as I preach that to you, some of you, that lodges in your heart so deeply. In your heart, you start to say, you know what? I've allowed my focus to be so distracted. I've totally equated success with God's blessing. I think that the only way I can be blessed is if I have three garages to park my cars in and plenty of zeros on the left side of the decimal. And so often we look at things and we say, okay, God, this is my picture of how it should work. I know what you told me. And so in order for me to be blessed, in order for me to be uh, walking in your favor, in order for me to be doing what you want me to do, it's got to work according to my plan. And when we do that, we just take the dream, we take the plan, and we put it in our own grinder and we say, God, I own this now. And Joseph says, no, no, keep the focus on God. Hey, that dream of a marriage God gave you, it belongs to God. That dream of parenting that God gave you, it belongs to him. That occupation, that career, those friendships, all of the things that God birthed in your heart, they still belong to him. And the moment that you try to grasp them or contain them or corral them, then you take the ownership away from him. Let me encourage you this morning, keep the focus on God. Can we give him praise together for all he's doing? Amen. Turn with me to Luke chapter seven. There's another story in here of a person who's walking in disappointment. 
And let me remind you while you're turning there, just because you're disappointed or discouraged doesn't mean that you're outside of the will of God. Just because you're walking in a time where everything doesn't make sense doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. Just because you're in a season in your life where everything's not totally productive and, and you're not on the mountaintop, it doesn't mean that God is far away from you. If I could remind you of the words of the psalmist, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're still with me. Let me encourage you today, God is with you in your discouragement. There's a woman in Luke chapter 7 who's discouraged. Let's read about her. It says this in verse 11. Now it happened the day after that he went into the city. He is Jesus here. He went into the city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him in a large crowd. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother and she was a widow and a large crowd from the city was with her when the Lord saw her he had compassion on her stop right there for a minute here's a woman who's already familiar with grief this this story and this scene this discouragement opens up in a funeral procession and it's, it's a part of a story of a woman who already knows what it means to hurt because the Bible identifies her as a widow. Her husband died. And in her culture and in her time, that means when her husband died, her livelihood died. Her, her way of making a living died. Her status in the community died. But she still had a little bit of hope because she had a son and this son could take care of her. This is a good son. He will take care of her. This is somebody that's going to look after her. It's going to be okay, mama, because son's going to take care of you. But then the scripture tells us that he dies. And I, I, I don't know about you, but I can't help but picture as they're walking out of the city, as they're, they're, they're walking in this funeral procession, as they're walking with this body in front of them, uh, this woman in her heart and in her mind, she's grieving She's lost a husband and now a son. And some of you know that pain. Some of you know what it means to have a heart full of grief and a head full of questions. How's it going to work out now? What am I going to do? You know that this woman in her mind, she started doing the math. She started saying, well, you know, I, I've got this much in my purse and I've got this much in the cupboard. Uh, how, how am I going to make it work? How's it going to happen for me? And while she's walking out to bury her son, she's getting ready to bury all of her dreams and her way of living. But before we get to the miracle, and this is one of the struggles with us in Christianity, we have the ability to go ahead and we want to get right to the resurrection piece. We want to get right to the miracle. We want to get right to the shout. But live in her sandals for a moment. Experience her grief and her compassion, or her, her, her struggle for a moment. The Bible says before the resurrection, before any of that, a large crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. You know, in your discouragement, it's easy for you to feel isolated and unnoticed. Nobody sees me. Nobody knows what I'm going through. Nobody cares. Can I remind you, the Lord sees you. Just like he saw this woman in the, in the moments of her grief and despair, in the moments when she wasn't sure what was going to happen next, in the moments of uncertainty, in the moments of, dear God, what are you doing? The Lord not only saw her, but he had compassion on her. Did you know that the Lord has compassion on you? The Lord cares for you. Jason, I, I don't know. I don't see a lot of that in the Bible. I don't see a lot of that in my life. L let me remind you, Isaiah 30, 18 says, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He will rise up and show you his compassion. Isaiah 49, 13, the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. James 5, 11, the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Lamentations 3, 22, though he brings grief, he will show compassion. Great is his unfailing love. Psalm 103, 13, 
as a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Psalm 145, 9, the Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 4, praise be to God, the Father and Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive. Psalm 103, praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives your sins and heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. We have a compassionate God. If you don't get anything else from this, you know, there's such a push in our culture to be seen. I feel like nobody sees me. I feel like I'm unnoticed. And our culture pushes, you know, you got to be the best. You got to have the most. You got to go to the top. And we feel isolated and alone. If that's you today, if you feel discouraged because you're wondering, God, I, I don't know what's happening. I don't know if anybody even sees me. The Lord has compassion on you. And he said to her, do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin and those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And so he who was dead sat up and began to speak and he presented him to his mother. You see, it was over for this widow. Her life was over, her livelihood was over, her family was gone. But let me remind you, it might be over for you, but it's not over for Jesus. So often we want to put him on our time frame. You might be in the 11th hour, but it's not the 11th hour for God. Our God's still able to speak and worlds are created. Our God's still able to speak and diseases are healed. Our God's still able to speak and marriages are healed. Our God's still able to speak and in a moment he can change anything. So let me encourage you, keep trusting Jesus Keep trusting Jesus in the funeral home. Keep trusting Jesus in the hospital. Keep trusting Jesus. When you walk in that home and you're not sure if she's still going to be there, keep trusting Jesus because it's never too late for him. There's another group of people who are discouraged, divinely disappointed. It's in Matthew chapter 26. It's a group of men called the disciples. These were men who followed Jesus for three and a half years. These were men who saw Jesus do things like he did for this widow of Nain. These are men who watched Jesus feed the thousands with just a little bit of food. These are men who saw and heard him teach. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is arrested. These men had an idea that Jesus was gonna come in and that he was gonna overthrow Rome and that he was gonna take all of those who were on the bottom and put them on the top. And all the things that were wrong are now gonna be made right. And all those people who've been marginalized and who, who've been discriminated against and all of those people who've been oppressed and mistreated, now he's gonna put us on top and we're gonna reign and we're gonna be in charge and we're gonna give it to them. And now he's arrested. Now he's tried, convicted, falsely accused. They see this Jesus who they believed was going to turn everything around in their favor, and he's hanging on a cross, and he dies. Can I just remind you that God never intervened while Jesus was on the cross? Jesus, his only begotten son, the one that he loved, the Jesus, who is God, God the Father never stepped in and made it easier. He didn't take any of it away. God did not intervene in any capacity when Jesus hung on that cross and died. When he, when he bore the sins of the world, God did not intervene at all. But yet Jesus hung on this cross, and these disciples look at him and they go, that's our ticket. We're done. And the Bible says that they all fled. They went back to their old way of living. 
They went back to fishing. They went back to tax collecting. They went back to being a doctor. And, you know, that was a nice dream, and it was a good ride. Three and a half years was great, but same old stuff. Talk about divine disappointment. But then on the third day, Jesus arose triumphantly from the grave. He conquered sin and death and hell. And he showed up in a powerful way. And it reminds us that faith in Jesus brings a hope that even death can't kill. That when we place our faith in Jesus, that he does a work on the inside of us, that situations on the outside might look like it's never going to happen, but we serve a God that specializes in the never going to happen. We serve a God that can do exceeding and abundantly above all we can ask or think. That means that that person that's addicted to drugs that you think is never going to change, God's got a plan to change their life. That means that 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 home that you think is a wreck and there's never going to be peace here, God's able to step in and speak peace in a moment. We serve a God that specializes in the impossible. And so today, I, I... I want to come to you, those of you that have this divine disappointment where you say, if I'm being honest, I just, I'm disappointed in the way things worked out. Listen, God was with Joseph in the disappointments of the prison. God was with the widow in the disappointment of grief. God was with the disciples in the disappointment of the death of Jesus. And God is with you in your disappointment. I don't know about you, I'd rather walk through the tough times with God than walk in the easy times without him. And so today, when we talk about this, that's what brings us to this table. Paul teaches us, he says, well, when you come to this table, What you're doing is you're remembering the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, and you're remembering it. You should do this until he comes. You see, there's a hope that lives on the inside of us, not because we're good or talented or able, but there's a hope that lives on the inside of us because Jesus is alive. And if nothing ever changes in my situation, I have an eternal hope that one day, Revelation 21, he'll wipe every tear from those that are crying. One day, all the things that are wrong will be made right. You see, it might not work out the way I think it's going to work out, but I can trust his plan because his plan never fails. I want to invite our elders who are going to be serving us today to come to their positions. We're going to come to this table today. And as we do, Paul teaches us that we should examine ourselves, that we should look on the inside of ourselves and and see if there's anything in there that keeps us from coming. Part of that examination today, here's what I want you to do. I want you to symbolically, I want you to bring your disappointments to this table today. Those of you that are walking in disappointment, maybe it's a work situation where you say, I'm just not sure how this is going to work out. I want you to bring it to this table today, symbolically saying, God, I give you everything you gave me. You're everything. I want you to come to this table today. And for some of you, you're going to be bringing your family because you didn't think your family life was going to look like it does, but here you are. And it's disappointing to you. For some of you, it's your friendships. Some of you, you thought you would have more friends and better, and you would, you would be more accepted. This would be a better social thing for you. And you find yourself lonely and isolated. And you're disappointed that God hasn't said yes yet. For some of you, it's a physical situation. You're waiting on God to heal cancer. And you've anointed and you've prayed the prayer of faith and you believe and you know it, but it just hasn't worked out yet. I want you to bring whatever your divine disappointment is. And I want you to bring it to this table and I want you to lay it down and I want you to pick up the bread and the juice. And together, we're all gonna, we're all gonna receive communion together, but we'll be receiving today saying, God, thank you that you got a plan for my life. And 
I might be a little bit disappointed now, but I recognize that your plan always prevails. If you're new around here, or maybe you haven't participated in communion, let me give you some instructions. We don't practice closed communion, which means you don't have to be a member of Metropolitan Church to come to this table today. This is not the church's table. It's not my table. It's the Lord's table. And so in just a moment, when, when it's your section's turn, you'll, your row will stand and you'll exit to my left and your right. You'll come to the table that's in front of your section. The elders will make sure you receive bread and juice. We want you to return to your seats. And then once everyone's been served, we'll all participate together. Some of you, it's difficult to navigate the aisles. If, if that's you, no problem. Once we go through the line, we'll make sure that our elders serve anyone who wants to receive communion. Just stay in your seat. You'll raise your hand later and we'll bring it to you. For some of you, you have severe gluten allergies. Our tables, our round tables on the ends have gluten-free communion. We do that because we value you. We wanna help take care of you. But as you come to this table today, as this team sings about a Jesus who paid it all, I want you to bring everything that you're discouraged about. I want you to bring everything that you're disappointed with. I want you to bring it to Jesus. And I want you to take up his body and his blood. And I want you to say, Jesus, in the middle of what I'm walking through, I recognize that you are with me. Father, we come to your table today, recognizing that you're a good God. And Lord, we pray today that we would bring you all of our discouragement, all of our disappointment, and that we would lay it at your feet. God, we thank you for paying the price for our sins. And we pray that as we lay these things on your table, that we would receive you with us, that we would be reminded that you're in control. Lord, help us to trust you. Help us to trust your power and your compassion and your grace. In Jesus' name. Would you come? I hear the Savior sing, thy strength is need is small, child of weakness, watch and wait, find in me thy all and all. Jesus paid it all.
receive communion would you just slip your hand up so that our elders can make sure everyone is served just hold that hand up if someone's seated next to you you could raise your hand for them I want to make sure everyone has an opportunity today to participate thank you elders for your service I appreciate what you're doing today our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And you know, I wouldn't be a good pastor if I told you that all the time everything's gonna be yes and you're always gonna get everything you want and God's gonna serve you according to your plan. But you know what? His plan is better than any plan I can come up with. God's plan A is better than my plan A. And so as you walk through this life, you may have discouragement. You might be divinely disappointed, but sometimes those divine disappointments are really divine appointments in disguise because God does such a powerful work in your life. You don't see how it's gonna turn around, but then out of nowhere, God shows up. Has anybody ever had God show up in your life? I can tell you this. One day he showed up in my life when he hung on a cross and he died for my sins. I believe that the blood of Jesus not only forgives every sin that I have, but it can heal sickness and disease. I believe that his body hung on the tree for us so that we can have eternal hope, knowing that salvation is now possible through faith in him. So today we come to this table and we bring all of our discouragement, all of our disappointments, all the plans that didn't work out, and we lay them at his feet. The good news is this, we serve a God that specializes in taking all of those broken pieces and making something beautiful out of them. Do you believe that today? On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Father, we thank you for this bread today. We thank you that it, re it represents Jesus who hung on a tree for us. We thank you that it represents the body of Christ. And as we receive it today, Lord, help us to receive all that comes with it, all of the good stuff and the tough stuff. Lord, help us to receive your plan. Lord, our ancestors ate man in the wilderness and perished, but you promised that those who eat this bread of life will never die. And so we receive it today. In Jesus' name, would you take the bread? And it was after supper, he took the cup. He said, this is a new covenant. It's a covenant in my blood. It's poured out for the remission of sins. Jesus hung on that cross as the substitution for us. He, he lived the life that I couldn't live and he died the death that I should have died. But he rose from that grave and because he's alive today, his blood has the power to save and heal and forgive. He said, every time you drink it, remember me. Father, we thank you for this cup today. We thank you for the blood that was poured out for us on Calvary's tree. And Lord, today, as we receive it, we pray, God, that you would remind us that you are with us in the darkest moments, when life doesn't make sense, when we're discouraged and disappointed. Lord, when, when we're walking through the prison of doubt and discouragement like Joseph did, we're in a funeral procession of grief like the widow of Nain. God, when we're just not sure why life is going this way like the disciples did, your blood brings a calm and an assurance that you're in control. Lord, we receive your cup today. In Jesus' name, would you take the cup? And now if you're comfortable, would you just find a place in the seat back in front of you? And if you're comfortable, would you just stand and lift your hands and thank God God, for all that he's doing in your life. Thank him for the good stuff and the tough stuff. 
Thank Him for all of the, all the things that worked out exactly like you wanted them to. And thank Him for the stuff that's just a mess right now because God's in the middle of your mess. Just lift your hands and thank Him today. Father, we come to you once again, recognizing that you're a good God. And Lord, our circumstances don't determine your goodness. But God, we come to you today, many of us with broken hearts, many of us with just a mess of things in our lives that we're not sure how it's gonna work out, but we're trusting you completely. And Lord, with our hands lifted, we surrender to you completely. We submit everything that we have to you I pray, God, that you would deliver from prisons. God, I pray that you would bring comfort and raise the dead, that you would comfort the grieving widows. God, I pray today that you would bring order and structure to the scattered disciples that wonder why things are going the way they are. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, reminding us that you are with us through everything we face. And God, I pray today for every person under the sound of my voice, that as they walk out into an unbelieving world, that they would carry an unbelievable message of grace. And God, I pray that they would walk into divine appointments, that you would show yourself to be strong and mighty in every situation. God, that you would orchestrate and ordain things that are supernatural. God, that you would do a work that human hands can't do, that human planning can't do. And Lord, when we walk through that and we see that victory, we'll turn around and say, God, you are so good to us. In Jesus' name we pray. And the whole church says, you love the Lord today? Are you thankful for his goodness today? I'm gonna have Pastor Clint come and dismiss you, but before he does, let me see this. Jennifer and I are so thankful for you. You are such a wonderful group to be a part of. You really are a church family. And I love the way that you come alongside and you help and you care and you nurture and you look after the people in this body and the people in this community. And it is a great, it is truly an honor and a privilege to be your pastor. And I want you to know that I'm praying for you, that our staff is praying for you. For those of you that are walking through this divine disappointment, I want you to know that we're available to talk to you. Maybe you just need somebody to sit and listen and pray with you. We would be honored to participate and to do that. Father, I pray blessings over your people. As Pastor Clint comes to dismiss us, we pray that we would not be dismissed from your presence. But let us carry your spirit with us. In Jesus' name we pray. There's a phrase that I like to use that says, yay God, yay God. There's just so many things to say yay God about sometimes. And, and I say yay God today because I say yay God that we have a pastor that he was so sensitive to the Lord's voice on a Thursday that he changed his sermon. And I say yay God because the Lord was working behind the scenes because he knew you and I needed to hear what he shared with our pastor about on a Thursday. I say yay God to that, don't you? I say yay God that you're here. I say, yay, God, that whether you've been here for many years, I say, yay, God, to that. I say, God, yay, God, if this is the first time you've ever been here, I'm so thankful for that. And uh, and so we are just truly delighted and honored that you are here today. Uh, hey, there is so many wonderful and exciting things taking place here at Metro, not just on Sunday mornings, but on Wednesday night. There is a sense of excitement on this campus every Wednesday night at 630, and we want you to be a part of it. It is for every age nursery, children, youth, young adult, adults, I mean all of, all across there are things taking place and if you're not connected with us on Wednesday night hey, come be with us. Wednesday night meals have started back and that's a great way of starting back on Wednesdays and getting your night kicked off in the right way and so there's just so many great things and we want you to be a part of it. When you leave today there's going to be an opportunity for you to give no matter which door that you go out today I'm going to dismiss us with a word of prayer. Lord, we love you and we're so thankful and we do say, yay, God. We're so thankful, God, for the word that was brought today, Lord. We're so thankful for the fellowship with other believers today. And we know that your name was lifted up today. And we pray that we take that with us today as we go. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen. God bless you.